Okay, so after two days of covering David Moyes, today is we have discussed David Sullivan, really, because I think whilst it was a massive relief for all of us, I think it was a pivotal moment. When I say it, I'm obviously talking about securing Premier League safety. I think it was a pivotal moment for David Moyes, as we discussed the last two days. But I also think for David Sullivan, this is probably seen as as a crucial moment, but not the crucial moment he would have wanted. I'm not going to take you back over um, what the initial 10-point plan and what the dream was, but if we just condense it down and suggest that he wanted to basically take West Ham, move to the Olympic Stadium, flip it and sell us, that's gone. That model of, um, of using West Ham as an investment tool is gone. I think what's really important to look at West Ham now is... In terms of it being an investment that's going to make David Sullivan four or five hundred million, which he'll then split however he divvies it up with David Gold, but basically to make to flip the club and make a four or five hundred million pound profit on it is gone. That's not going to happen. I would suggest that there's still profit to be made in selling West Ham, but nothing like what was originally planned. So I think really what I'm sort of asking and what I'm wondering myself and the purpose of this video is is how much does David Sullivan want West Ham? How much is it worth the hassle? And when I say the hassle, I think there's a few things to take into account. A lot's changed uh, just in the last few months in, in the world and in football itself, but in particular at West Ham United. I take you back to just before lockdown and the Hammers United march, which by conservative estimates had between seven and eight and a half thousand fans in attendance. I was there, I saw it with my own eyes. There were a lot of people, a lot of fans mobilized, a lot of unhappy and disgruntled supporters for all the reasons that we've gone into on numerous videos I won't bore you with now. The march got the permission from the Metropolitan Police, it got permission from uh, the London Borough of Newham, and enough people were unhappy that they attended in such vast numbers. Now, I guess the question to ask is, are those people suddenly happy now? Well, it depends if you think they were marching because we were low down in the league and our Premier League safety was at risk or whether there was a bigger picture to it. I would suggest there was a much bigger picture to it and it was really about how the club was run and about how things are... It, you know, look, all, all, it's all, all the GSB out T-shirts were there. You know, Gold Sullivan Brady. It's all lies, lies, lies. Was one of the um, was one of the mantras being used. Was one of the chants, one of the songs. Um, I think there was a lot more to it, basically, than just how we were uh, performing on the pitch. Let's be fair. We're West Ham United fans. We're used to a relegation or two, and we've seen a few crappy players and managers in our time. So, I think there was more to it than that. The the first march, I think, at about 1,500. It wasn't really a march. I called it a march. The first protest where there were guest speakers, which was not far from our boats, um, just situated outside the stadium, right next to the Aquatic Centre. I would I would guess at 1,500 to 2,000 people there. If you remember, I did a video on it. It certainly wasn't the five 600 that was reported. Now, um, to go from that to nigh on 8,000 shows... A massive momentum and it shows something really growing. So I think it's probably reasonable to assume that that would have carried on had lockdown not have happened. Possibly one of the one of the main beneficiaries of lockdown happening was probably David Sullivan, because it basically meant that fans weren't going to the stadium. And if fans aren't going to the stadium, then fans aren't congregating outside the stadium and baying for blood, basically. And I, and I use that purely metaphorically speaking. I'm not suggesting they were, were going to do that because I do think what happened with the Hammers United was far more organised than what went before. I think um, it was very much instructed that you um, that it was very much against the board, but you back the team and you don't do anything inside the stadium, which would be detrimental to West Ham getting um, a result. I like the fact that what happened was as soon as lockdown, it was very much the public statements from Hamish United were, were excellent. They were pretty much along the lines of look, public safety is an issue now. We, you know, don't let's 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 do things right. There's a bigger issue in the world at the moment, and us protesters about West Ham. Let's respect that. And um, and that was, was very much um, was very much the tone of things. But I do think it did it did give David Sullivan. It did him a massive favour. The reason I keep saying that Sullivan and, and not Sullivan and Gold or Gold, Sullivan, Brady, is you, you've got to remember what we have here is we've got a situation where 
you've got one man that's really running the club uh, from top to bottom. So I think he was really the focus of of the demonstration, the focus of of the angst, even though it was very much um, a bored out, or at least improving the current situation at West Ham. Now, by the fans not being able to go, I think things are... It's allowed David Sullivan a certain amount of wriggle room, a certain amount of breathing room. And I do wonder whether he used that to the best possible effect. But it certainly would have been a massive relief to him. Do I think that they want fans back, West Ham? Yes. But do I think uh, they probably enjoyed... The fact that there weren't any protests around, absolutely, 100%. I think what the survival has done and what securing Premier League survival has done is allowed him a massive sigh of relief after the fact that there's been no fans in there. So basically, he's had a, he's had a, he's had a period of time where he's not been under the same scrutiny that he was before. Understandably, people's minds were on other things. But I look at it now and I think, what does the future actually hold for him? because the running of the club is still more or less the same. You'll have noticed yesterday in the uh, in the David Moyes video, or the one the day before, or any of the other numerous David Moyes videos I might have done, you'll always see comments in there. It doesn't matter who we have as manager, they will always struggle whilst this mob are in charge. It was one of the comments there, sorry that I, I can't pull up the name, who said uh, Pochettino would struggle at West Ham. Basically, the insinuation is that because he's not given the back in, that he would have had at Tottenham or whatever, he would struggle here. Now, do we think an old dog can learn new tricks? Um, I, I think to a certain extent. I think Sullivan Sullivan will have learned to to give Moyes more control, to allow Moyes to, to, to build the backroom staff that he wants to. As, as I discussed yesterday, I'm not going to repeat myself on that one. But how much desire does Sullivan want how much does he have to remain in charge of West Ham? Because it's got it, it can't be easy for him. It can't be easy to be unpopular. It can't be easy when the fans don't like you. It can't be easy when people are protesting about you. It can't be um, easy when even we had the situation with a Sunday supplement, of course, before, where they were forced to um, offer a grovelling apology. I can't think of the guy's name now, but the, the journalist who hosts Sunday supplement had to apologise. He basically kicked off um, what is the Premier League's magazine football programme, which is about all the 20 clubs, was kicked off by a grovelling apology to Golden Sullivan. And really, nothing untoward, I felt, was said. But the stories were at the time that, that the club had issued illegal threats that if they didn't retract their statements, the Sky Sports, then there would be a legal, um, legal proceedings would be pending on that. So I just think when you're under attack from the media who who were sort of really grasped the nettle, by the way, so the fans were going at them, the media were going at them, how much joy are you getting out of it? Well, I would imagine in terms of a comfort blanket, in terms of insulation against all of the all of the barbed comments that you're getting, I would imagine sort of five the, the prospect of earning four or five hundred million pounds is probably quite a nice comfort blanket to that. I would imagine that probably sees you through. But what about when that's off the table? So we know that Golden Sullivan, I said I would imagine it's mostly Sullivan, have injected a rights issue and a shares issue to, to inject 30 million into the club. But what are just to keep it running basically because of the the money that was lost over um over the COVID-19 lockdown period. We know the players didn't take a pay cut. They took um they just took a deferral, which I think has been paid back now. So the players were paid in full. The staff were paid in full. And you've got to give West Ham credit for this. There, there was not the shambles coming out of West Ham that you had at Tottenham Hotspur. OK, so basically West Ham stood up and said, no, we're going to be self-sufficient throughout this. Granted, Tottenham um, backtracked on their um, on their furlough into their staff. But they, I they do believe they still took a... Um, a government loan as well. I mean, which when you've just spent a billion pound on a stadium, um, when you've just um, the year before posted 113 million pound profit, I don't think that sits quite right. West Ham didn't do any of that. West Ham actually behaved impeccably. On this very channel, I, po I published a letter that they'd sent out to staff, reassuring the staff, saying, keep yourself safe, don't worry, uh, we'll pay your wages, 
you know, um, let's look after ourselves, look, look after each other as well and protect the NHS. Impeccable. I, I got no problem with the club doing that. I think they handled themselves very, very well. But what but what about if Sullivan's not gonna get his money? He's injected thirty million quid. What do I think he's, he's a billionaire? David Sullivan's a billionaire. Do I think he's got a billion pounds worth of cash kicking around at the moment? No, I don't. I don't think he's got anything like that at all. I think you'll find most of his money is tied up in what will be called investments. And when I say investments, I don't mean these little film projects, which are probably a few millionaire on air. I say I've, <laughs> I band the words around a few millionaire on air as if, as if it's nothing. But you've got to imagine, uh, to someone like that, it's, it's possibly not. I'm talking where's the bulk of his money? Where's most of his billion quid? And the, the majority of that billion quid is tied up in property. And now you've got to look at what's actually happened. In particular, I understand, as I understand it, is commercial property. That's taken a massive hit. So actually, I would imagine David Sullivan's net worth has reduced drastically. I wouldn't be surprised if David Sullivan's probably, he'd probably say, oh, poor diddums, you know. He's probably having to sell a few properties to, to get working capital for elsewhere. It can't be easy. It can't be nice for him at the moment. And I just wonder if he if he has the desire anymore, not only to bankroll West Ham, but to hold out for for that money that just ain't gonna come now. Is he gonna get I think I think there was a point when West Ham probably thought they could move to Olympic Stadium, flip it, and get seven hundred million. Not a chance. How long ago was it I did that Newcastle video? How long was it? A long time, months ago. 300 million, Ashley was asking for that. It still ain't gone through. Um, I don't think that you'd get an awful lot for West Ham. I don't think the figures would be vastly different to that. We don't have any assets. We don't own the stadium. So, realistically, if we are worth 250, 300 million, can you see that being a whole lot more? In two years' time? I don't think so. I just don't think it's worked. And with that in mind, how much desire does he have? Now, I think Sullivan is a workaholic, much like David Moyes. I think he likes he likes the deal. He likes to um, be involved in the football. Apparently, he hardly ever leaves his office. His office, I remember watching a, what was it? I've, I've, I've a documentary or something. It was a little clip of him and he walked past his swimming pool. He hadn't been in his swimming pool. What's the point in having one? The point of the matter is, David Sullivan's not someone who enjoys the trappings of success, he gets a buzz from the deal. So maybe it's that. Maybe that keeps him involved in football. Maybe he sells West Ham, maybe he buys another club. But, and we'll get on to how much transfer budget we have going forward, because I really don't know. But bearing in mind, I don't think the club are in a position really to start asking the fans yet for the remainder of the season ticket money. They can't sell season tickets at the moment, can they? Who can? So there would normally be a massive amount of money coming into the club at this point. Not only that, the club off the back of more season ticket sales would, gem would usually be getting a loan. It gets called a payday loan. But the loan is from Michael Tabor's company. And Michael Tabor, if you don't know, was somebody who tried to take over West Ham and move us to Beckton many, many years ago. And um, and it didn't happen. But we basically, we basically borrow against our ticket money each season, which shows you how little working capital there actually is in the club. So what I'm saying is, really... Well, I, I can see two. Well, I say two things happen. There's one of three things happen. Either David, either David Sullivan sells, or if he doesn't, and I am not. If I don't think he's going to get the offer, I think can David Sullivan really accept in his mind that he's not getting those big bucks that originally he was going to get? Can he look at it and think, okay, look, I've had ten years here. I'm going to make hundred pound profit. Ah, oh, poor thing. Because I think he would. As I say, how he splits that, I don't know. Can he do that? Yes. So would he leave if someone's interested? Quite possibly. If he stays, what's going to happen? Well, we understand it that David Moyes might be interested in a few players. Can we go out and sign one stellar signing for 40 odd million quid? No. Is David Moyes going to be given 30 million quid to spend? I'm not so sure. But if he is... Or let's say it's 25 million to buy the fella from 
QPR, to buy the fella from Wigan, to buy the striker from Brentford. Let's say all that can be done for 25 million. Okay, fine. Is David Sullivan going to bankroll it? Because he's going to have to. Because there's no ticket money there. How are you going to borrow to get the payday loan money? How are you going to get that when you're going to secure it against ticket sales that haven't come in yet? I don't know. Maybe Sky give their money early. Who knows? Is he going to put it in? No. So how are we going to fund that 25 million? Well, it's going to be player sales. And just leaving the Declan Rice thing aside for one moment, I think that if you're looking at other players who you're going to have to accept that you're not going to get the money that we originally paid for them. Philippe Anderson would be a case in point. Maybe that's how Moyes funds his, his summer transfer dealings. I don't know. But again, you're very much relying that sale happening quickly. If it is Philippe Anderson, well, what, is he going out the door next weekend? Because you'd need that. Because he's not going to have a clear run at the left back at, at Wigan, at Robinson. He's not going to have a, a clear run at Ollie Watkins. There will be other clubs interested. So the funds need to be there to make the deal happen sharpish. Again, is Sullivan going to want to do that? I don't know. I also think that once things go back, there's still this massive issue of discontent with the fans. Has everybody, have 8,000 people, and those are the only people that attended, been won over because basically they couldn't attend football for a long time and we avoided relegation by the skin of our teeth? I'm not so sure. And if that's the case, has the angst and the anger towards David Sullivan gone away? Definitely not. So, bearing in mind, the fans are still unhappy with him. He's going to have to plough in money or sell players to compensate for the fact that there is no season ticket money. Bearing in mind, the dream has died of him either A, making West Ham a top club, a top six club, whatever it might have been, or B, in making a fortune out of it. Realistically, is David Sullen... Sullen? <laughs> it's David Sullivan. Hey, David is Sullen, actually. <laughs> really, it's... <is. laughs> um, is Sullen David Sullivan going to be asked for West Ham anymore? 